Okay, now I'm starting a recording. It's hard to remember every time that you that I have to start the recording. Okay, now let's see the. Let me share another screen, which is the this one. Let me check. Well, let me let me start sharing this one. In the Intel microcontrollers, uh, the classical 80, 50s, 8048, 8049, 8050, 8750, 8751 from Intel, this was the architecture. Now, this is a question for all of you. Is that architecture Harvard or von Neumann? You see, there is one CPU, one data bus, data memory, program memory, everything is in one bus. What architecture is that? Uh, what's it called, von Neumann? Uh, I can hear you. Was it von Neumann? Yep, von Neumann. Yes, von Neumann. Von Neumann, correct. It's not Paul yeah. Neumann. It's yeah, because they use it use a eight bit for everything. So one... yeah. correct, eight bits for everything, and they required twelve clock cycles for a single instruction. Twelve clock cycles. Okay, so they were good in their time. I used to work with them and industry. I, I used to write code for these devices. I, I recall all those instructions very well. And I used to solve, troubleshoot equipment, changing the code. And uh, I just wanna show you <laughs> This uh, this instruction, that one, you see, uh, uh, jump. And now it's called uh, go to in the new microcontrollers. In the previous microcontrollers, it was jump, jump to this address. And that jump was unconditional. Jump in direct, jump to another memory page. Okay, now conditionals, jump if there is a carry, jump if there's no carry. Carry means that when you do an addition, you have a carry. Like when you, when you add a three plus two is equal to five, but if you make a plus two is equal to zero and you have a carry a one, so you have number 10, okay? When you go from one digit to two digits, from one digit to two digits, there is a carry. So if there is a carry jump, if there's no carry jump, if, if the accumulator, if the working register is zero, you jump. Jump if there's no zero, jump if the test input T0, any line, an input port called T0, jump if T0 is equal to one. Jump in T0 is equal to zero. Who changes the polarity? An exclusive OR gate, as we always see it in previous lessons. Jump T1 is one, jump if not T1. Jump if the flip flop, the, a flag, a flip flop is equal to zero. Jump if flip flop one. Jump on timer flag. Jump on interrupt. Jump on accumulator bit to this address. So you see, there are many types of jumps, okay? In, there used to be many types of jumps. And even when we're learning the new micros, I can tell you this, if you go to, the, to industry, manufacturing industry, where, whether it is light manufacturing, like electronics, small components, or heavy manufacturing, like auto industry, in many cases, you will find in industry, this type of processor from Intel, 
they don't change them. They're always there. And you can see in many patients, they're looking for people to know this language to repair their, their machinery, their equipment. And they're looking for people. I still see them these days. And they say, I, I'm looking for an engineer or a technician with experience in these microcontrollers from Intel willing to repair these boards. And uh, I used to repair those boards from my company. I can't say the name. They told me, don't, don't say it. And I was charging good, good amount of money to repair their, their PC boards. I used to have a board here, but I probably place it somewhere, somewhere else. Yeah, I don't recall where I place it. It was a big board with so many components. I, I thought uh, it was here. I, I swear it was here. Well, I mean, moving many things here in my in my room. And and that board used to have many chips, many many chips. So when you are an expert in repairing boards, uh, you charge more than a thousand dollars to repair it. Believe me, because nobody else will be able to repair it. So this is how you call a subroutine, how you return returns and all that. So I learned this for many years and I used to teach this for many years, but we are in 2021, of course, and since the year 2000, I switched to um, pick microcontrollers. They are the best selling microcontrollers in, in the world. Okay, they are the world leaders. I'm not teaching you an old fashioned microcontroller. No, I'm teaching you a new type of microcontroller. So let me stop this here. Now I have to go to, hopefully this thing will not crash. But I need to share. I need to share it first. Now, can you see that? Yeah. A new block diagram? Yeah. Okay. That's uh, that's the, the peak micro we will see in this class. Now, and this is state of the art, one of the best microcontrollers controllers for engineers, for future engineers. In, in the 90s or in the early 2000s, this ship will cost more than $40. But now it's less than $2, okay? So what, are, what architecture is that? Harvard or Bonneumann? Look at the program memory. It has a data bus, ports, RAM, and all the, the instructions from the- It's a harbor? Pardon me? It's a harbor? Yeah, this is harbor. You have, you have two buses here. Yeah. There are two buses. So one bus controlling all these piece of equipment, all these piece of stuff. That one. And that one is only to uh, program the, the CPU. So. Yeah, it has to, another one here. This one is what makes the, the memory, the CPU or the, the architecture uh, harbor. So while, while this one fetches or delivers, the fetches one instruction here, the RAM or the data can be traveling from here to to the CPU, so, or it can be performing, executing one instruction while uh, the new one is being fetched. And that way it is more reliable. So this, uh, this is the architecture, but uh, of course you will be expecting from me to give you lessons, uh, video lessons on YouTube about many of these blocks, okay? I will 
it will take us a good amount of time explaining this and uh, the instruction set. So this device, um, let me show you first. Okay. This is the data sheet for the PIC 69F. 15 slash nine. So the only difference is that 15, it has less, less pins and this, this one, uh, it has 14 pins and this one has 20 pins. So it is an eight bit flash because it has a flash memory. These are the characteristics, the core features, only 49 instructions. Okay. Only 49 instructions, 125 nanoseconds instruction cycle. You see, it's very fast. Comparing the, the old micros, which would require 10, 12 microseconds to perform an instruction. Okay. Uh, microseconds, I didn't say nanoseconds. So if I say 10 microseconds, I'm saying 10,000 nanoseconds. Compare 10,000 nanoseconds of the old Intel microcontrollers, 10,000, 12,000 to 120. Okay. It's more than 20, 40, more than 100 times faster than the previous micros. It has a 16 level deep architecture or hardware stack. That means you can invoke or you can call up to 16 nested uh, subroutines or methods because one inside the other, one inside the other, they are nested. If they're not nested, you can call any, any number you want. It has an 8-bit timer, four 16-bit timers, low current, power on reset, which is called POR, P, uh, power up reset timer, brownout reset. The brownout reset, this one means that uh, if the battery goes low, uh, equal to less than three volts, it'll, it'll reset. It has configurable logic cell CLC. That's it has four CLCs. That means uh, it has PLDs, programmable logic devices. You want to buy a PLD, you will have to spend two dollars, one or two dollars for each CLC. Now they are integrated. So it allows you to solve Boolean logic. Uh, faster in, in nanoseconds uh, compared uh, with, with respect to the the other way to solve it, which is by by writing code and asking for the conditions. With the Boolean logic, you solve it immediately in one clock cycle. Okay. And the logic is also sequential logic because it has flip-flops. It has combinatorial because it solves Boolean logic like gates, Boolean gates like and or exclusive or, okay? So you, you, you can set your conditions. It has a complementary waveform generator. This is used for generating high power signals. Like if you wanna make an inverter convert DC voltage into AC voltage in green energy, like the wind turbines or turbines that you see in the valley. You, uh, all of them, all, right there, there are thousands, thousands of CWGs to convert DC into AC. So that one is integrated there. Of course, you can buy a CWG by itself. And it has a dead band control. That's very important because that way you don't kill the components. If you don't have a dead band control, the transistors will blow up, will explode. 
not not here not here <clears throat> oh, it has uh, other characteristics right here to capture pwms to control power uh, smt for to create timers uh, there is an article we will publish uh, i will co-author this article with kevin which is here in the group and we Kevin was working with this project since last semester. Uh, we did the editing and it'll be published uh, next week. It is in the editing process by the magazine at this moment. So you will learn about SMTs. 24-bit timer, multiple gate and clock inputs, angular timer, single pulse. It, ha it has all these features, 8-bit counter, Pascaler, math accelerator, Okay, with proportional in integral derivative P control. So it has a PID, a PID. So you don't have to design it externally, it is integrated. And this is used in the drills, in the electric drills. Have you seen, have you noticed when you are making a hole on the wall or putting a, a screw, a wood screw, have you noticed how the speed is constant? And if you release it, it will not get burnt. So it, it changes the torque, it changes the force depending on how strong, how hard it is the wall or the screw. And all those drill, electric drills from any brand, they used the, the, PW, the PWM. Okay. Another thing. Here is um, here are communications. So you can make a wireless controller. You can send data through with RF for 430 radio frequency at 430 megahertz or Bluetooth. So you can communicate via wireless with another device. So now that everything is wireless, these devices have the, the, e, the user. Universal, universal synchronous, asynchronous receiver trans, transmitter. And it, it has these types of communication, SPI, I2C, RS-232, RS-485. All these, all these three are for low, uh, low distance. RS-485 is for long distances, up to 3,000 or 4,000 4, feet. And you can communicate with another micro for an older device, a camera, to control a camera using RS-485, okay? So it has all these 17 IO, input output pins that you can control, a 10-bit analog to digital converter. So you can convert a, a physical variable such as temperature, pressure, uh, you can measure oxygen, saturation, you can measure alcohol. And this is how they make a breathalyzer. That way police detects if somebody has been drinking because this device has a 10-bit A to D. So you put a sensor, a gas sensor, a ethanol sensor, and you will detect the, how much alcohol that person has been breathing, has been uh, drinking, sorry. Uh, two comparators, voltage comparators, an 8-bit digital to analog converter, Voltage reference, so it has a thinner inside. Zero cross detection for alternating current applications to synchronize the devices with other AC sources, alternating current sources. And the clock is a 16 megahertz clock. Okay, but you can accelerate it uh, up to 32 megahertz because internally it has a phase lock loop, a PLL. Yeah, That's all the, these are all the things that this device has. We, we are using this one, the, the one on the bottom. And look at the memory, it has 8,000 8,000 locations of memory, 8,000 times 14 bits. So you can write 
up to 8,192 instructions. Okay, instructions in assembler code. Some other instructions from high structure languages like Java, C++, if they consume more instructions, you will use more memory depending on, on your application. Uh, and it has uh, these, uh, the run memory is 1000, 1K. The high endurance memory is 1000. The run memory is volatile. So if the power goes up, the data will be lost. But if you, you don't want to lose data. You can store it in the HEF and the right here. You can store it there. But the, there is a limit in reading and writing cycles. It, it is not unlimited. Okay, I think you can write it for one million. This one, the the HF, HEF, you can write it a thousand, uh, not a thousand, a hundred thousand times. We will see it here. <clears throat> okay, and these are all the things that it has. This is how the device looks. BDD is power, BSS is ground. You have one port, which is called RA, with five bits, RA0, 1, 2, RA, six bits, RA3, RA4, RA5. So six lines of for port eight. For port B, you have RB4 through RB7, four lines. For RC or port C, RC0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So you have a byte, a whole byte for this port to read or write. In those, in all those lines, you can read or you can read data or you can write data. So they are I/O devices, input output devices. There's only one pin that is that only acts as an input, and that is R3. Okay, R3 is an input only, an input pin only. It can't be an output. And these are how the pins are allocated. In the sometimes you might change them, change them to another by doing programming. You can change the functions to another pin. But we will not see that in this class. We will just take care. Of, with this table, you can reference. Oh, where is this pin? Where is this output? Where is my timer? Where is my zero control detection? So. Where is AN2, AN3, analog inputs? Where are they? So you can find them on which pin they are because that table is a summary of the allocation. So, and right here you have the, the contents of this data sheet. I will give you the link for this data sheet or you can find it. Just Google the word PIC 16 lf sixteen fifteen slash nine data sheet and you will find it. But download it from microchip. Don't download it from other place, okay? I'm not responsible if you download it from other place because other places might have a virus and your computer might get, might get crashed. So don't download it, only download it from microchip technology from that site, microchip.com. Okay, uh, there are many definitions. Uh, okay, so here we have the architecture, uh, the internal block. This is the CPU, this is where the clock is, the internal oscillator. So you don't need an external clock, you can use the internal oscillator. But you need an accuracy for good measurement, you need an external clock, a crystal oscillator. This is where you write your code in assembler language or any other language, the compiler will store the code right there. It'll download the code using a, a programmer. Oh, what is a programmer? I got this programmer today for $12. This is a cable. 
<laughs> and you have to download the, the code. This. It is. <laughs> I hope you can see it. It is a, a small program. You can see it there. Okay. So that one is for twelve dollars. But we will give you the code for every practice or for every experiment you will be doing. So you have three ports of communication. So every microcomputer communicates with external devices like a printer, a wireless device, Bluetooth device. It communicates using ports, okay? Port A, port B, port C with the data bus. And you can get the RAM data from here. The RAM data will not, cannot travel directly from this memory to a port. To any port, no. The RAM data has to travel to the CPU first, right here. Okay, and and then the CPU will process the data using the arithmetic logic unit, and then and then it'll transfer the data to port A, port B, or port C. Even if the data doesn't do any process, it has to go to W. W is a working register. It is inside here. So, and there are other blocks like, like this one, the, the voltage regulator, the DAC, ADC, digital to analog converter, analog to digital. It has a temperature indicator. You can read it to determine if the chip is too hot or it is cold and, and you want to know, you can read the temperature. And of course, if you have the device in, in, a, in a room, in a lab, you can read the ambient temperature. It has other features here, C1, C2, at this moment, I don't recall what they are. Uh, PWMs, timers, all the timers, the the waveform generators, SMTs, PIDs, uh, configurable logic, and uh, zero control detection, CCP1 and 2. These are for generating PWM signals. Okay. So you can read the, the ARCID. What is our RA0? Oh, it is a general purpose. Uh, what are the functions that you can do with this with this pin? You can read a digital signal, you can read an analog signal, you can read a, a comparator positive input, you can use the DAC, you can use uh, you can use it as a communication device or pin for data input output. Okay. Then that way you, you can determine in this table what you want to do with every pin, for example, RA1. Oh, I want to read a voltage. So you can read it on AM1. Okay. Why? Because it is an analog voltage. So or you can use it as a reference voltage in other applications. Okay. And first, we will do uh, very simple practices, very simple code okay, to understand how the, the device works. So uh, make sure the table is for the 1619, okay? Because the other table was for the 19, uh, the 15, I'm sorry. So this one is for the big 16F 1690, okay? RA0, RA1, RA2. These are the other multiple functions any pin can do. Okay, RA3, okay, RA4, so RA5. RB4, RB5, I recommend that you read all that because you need to know the device, okay? RC0, RC1, what is? Oh, it's a general purpose input output, but it can also be an, an, an ADC channel. It can be a comparator negative input, comparator negative input. It can be a timer for input. You see, it can be many other things, every single pin. 
So once you read all that, and uh, this is the core block diagram. This is where the good stuff starts regarding this class, because it is assembler code and machine organization or computer architecture. I found out in an old uh, syllabus from 2016, 2017, when this class was taught by Mr. Kashapal, I found out that the class was called uh, assembly language and machine and computer organization. And then it was changed to machine organization. Okay. And this is how a computer is organized. So you have the enhanced mid-range CPU. This is a CPU that we saw a moment ago in the previous figure as a block, big block diagram with everything connected. This is a CPU, okay? And it looks, you see, that's a, a, the whole CPU. But once you, once you understand everything, it is very similar to the micro sequencer. But of course, more powerful than a micro sequencer because right here, now we have an arithmetic logic unit and the, it is ALU. An arithmetic logic unit, this one has two inputs, okay? This input with this arrow and this input right there. And this arrow is, is wrong right there. It should be very cool. Okay, so it has two operands, two inputs. And you can perform the addition, subtraction, Boolean functions, masks, masking data, and other uh, arithmetic operations like shifting data to the left, shifting data to the right. You can do all that or complementing the, the data. You can do it with this arithmetic, arithmetic logic unit. The heart of every microcomputer is the working register, you see it there, WREG or WREG, working register. In other, in the previous micros from Intel, they used to call it the accumulator, accumulator or ACC. But Microchip decided to call it W, the working register. Okay. Many people complain about that. And they were saying in those days, why did you call it W? Why don't you call it like the other ones, uh, ACC? Okay, this is the heart because this is where all the data must flow through the working register, all data, no exceptions. So you can't do data by moving data from one place for example, you can't store data from here through the to the run memory uh, there directly. Well, there are some exceptions. So let me show you. This is where you write the code, the flash program memory. Right there, you write the code. Every time you write a, an instruction is read, the instruction is fetched to the instruction register right there. And who is addressing the, the memory? Because a, any memory requires a device to address every single location. So it is done by a program counter. 15 bits, this uh, slash 15 means there are 15 wires, 15 bits addressing the program memory. So it is two to the 15 locations, which is 800 and more than 800 and uh, than 8K, more than 8,000. So just remember two to the eight is 256, two to the 10 is 1K, 1,024, two to the 11, 2,048, two to the 12, 4,096 and so on. You continue until you reach two to the 15. 
And this is the data bus. So the data bus has connection with the RAM memory. And remember, we saw multiplexers. Now you see why we have to see multiplexers and encounters, because a multiplexer, multiplexer selects different sources of data. So this program memory can have an address from here, or it can be uh, addressed from here. OK. It's like having a house with two streets, one street on the right side and another street on the left side. So you can reach different locations, OK? Different addressing modes at the, uh, in different times. Don't, they can't be at the same time. Um, there are they, there are memories that they, they are called dual port memories or triple port memories manufactured by Cypress. Those memories, RAM memories or flash memories, those are very high speed memories because they have dual ports. So you can read two data, two bytes at the same time. Right here, no, you can only read one piece of byte, one piece of data at a time. So the, the program memory can be a, can have data from the program counter, can be addressed by coming by data from this file select register one, or it can have data from file select register zero. The instruction reg, reg starts the instruction that it is fetched while the program counter is addressing a new location. The 16 level stack is takes care of storing the return addresses. Every time you invoke a method, uh, you, you're invoking an algorithm and you go there, you need to know where you, where you were. Otherwise you will be lost and you need to return to where you were and then you go to the next, the very next instruction. Okay. And then you have another location here, program memory uh, read. You have the run memory where you have volatile data and the memory can be addressed by different modes, by BSR, FS, FSR0 or FSR1. Or it can be addressed by the instruction register. Okay, notice that it, it can be addressed. You cannot load data from here to here. No, you can only address. You can, you can only give a, an address location not data, just the address, okay? That's why you see there RAM addresses, RAM address, not RAM data. The RAM data comes here. This arrow, even when you see the arrow going downwards, it is a bidirectional arrow. So the data flows both ways. Uh, the, 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 I'm sorry, this is the address the data flows from here to the bus. But you can also store data in the RAM. That's why the, the arrow is downwards, because the data can come from the arithmetic logic unit from here. It travels this way, this way, and then the data is stored inside this memory. Okay. So if you read a data from, from a constant number from the program memory, it goes to the instruction register. The constant, the eight bits go here, they arrive to this multiplexer, they arrive to the ALU. If you don't wanna do, do nothing with the data, just keep it or as, as it was. It'll go here without any operation, no operation, and then it'll go to the working register and it'll flow back It'll go back to this loop and then it'll go travel and it'll be stored right there. That's the way it travels. The status register coming from the from this, this is an output, indicates if the operation you are doing, arithmetic or Boolean operation, is equal to zero. Or if there is a carry or no carry, you need to know uh, the, the status register will let you know, you know what, after doing this addition, I, ha I had a carry. So the status register will let you know. Okay. And this is a, 
instruction the code and control this is the most also one of the most important pieces the instruction and the code the code and control the instructions are stored here in binary code every assembler instruction is stored in binary the binary number comes here and this one takes care of controlling the arithmetic logic unit and all the multiplexers the select selecting channels selector channels are have to be controlled by by the instruction the code control okay you don't see those lines here but they are controlled by this one because this multiplexer needs control this are alu needs control and who is controlling all of them these max this lu this one this max who is controlling them the instruction the code and control logic okay i'm finished i'm ending this lesson today your homework for this Friday will be what I just said. In your notebook, tell me what every single box of this block diagram of this computer, core block diagram, tell me what they do. I did, I did that uh, for the last half an hour. So you can review this video if you want, if you will. Tell me what every block does. Only the blocks, uh, yeah, no, all, all the blocks, all the blocks. This is the internal block oscillator that clocks the, the, the program counter because the program counter, you see it there, but it, it, it needs a clock to keep addressing, to keep increasing and finding the locations. I have a question. Anything else do later this week, Professor? Or no, that'll be the only, the only homework for this week. Okay, but I'll, I'll give you till Friday. Today is Tuesday. Okay, you need more time, no, no problem. You can deliver it to me next Tuesday. I'll give you a week, it's better a week. So explain explain what every box is doing. Okay, what is instruction register doing? What is the, this one, this one, this one, this one, the status, the address multiplexer, what is the RAM? What, what do you do with the RAM memory? Okay. And many things are, are here, are written there. You can, you can read that, but not, not all of them matter. Most of them you will find in them. Okay, you just need to keep reading. We will not see instructions now, but what I'll do for Thursday, I will not do Zoom. I will prepare videos and I will post them on Thursday during the day, Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon. I will post your Thursday lessons. Okay, but anyway, we will meet every every Tuesday to stay in contact. So you have questions, so let me know, okay? And I know I've been here for almost one hour, but after the other one and a half hour that I'm missing is, is composed. So it'll be all the lectures that I will be posting, okay? So, uh, I will stop the share. And I will stop the recording.